Hello, everyone. I'm Christina Lin, and uh, welcome to the YBYLC is the future of the clock architecture. So basically, the idea of this webinar will be talking about what is bring your own cloud architecture and how we implement it in Red Panda. So kind of just get to give you an idea of what uh, kind of what we're going to go over today is kind of just going to go over what is VYOC and what the different deployments kind of deployment situations out there. And probably the majority of time we'll be going over the entire architecture overview of how things were separated and how we take care of things internally within our control plane. And last but not least, I'll walk you through a demonstrations of how our clients can actually connect to the VYOC environment, kind of just show you how things are things work practically in the users in uh, in users eyes, kind of just with that. Um, next is if we take a look at what streaming services were provided today, you got two kinds of different deployment options that people offer, right? The, the first one is more like the self-hosted where people would download the software and they would then install the software on top of, on top of their own cloud or they will install it in their data centers and they will manage the entire fleet of clusters on their own. So this is a very traditional way of how we operate um, from the beginning of the time. And this is good, but it, it kind of introduced some of the drawbacks of the longer ramp up time because in order for a company or a department to train a person, I really understand all the things underneath the hood, like how the how your infrastructure needs to be laid and how do you um, design your cluster to be running can be long. It takes longer for people to understand things. And also there's constraints of resource. You gotta have to pre-plan pre -plan, um, on the number of clusters you need. You probably have to know what kind of um, CPUs or hardwares or disk space that you wanna um, allocate it to this cluster. So there's a longer time of planning. Therefore, the the time taken for you to actually get things running will be a lot longer. And of course, there's going to be operational costs because the person that you've trained needs to, you know, this person needs to live, you got to pay for this person. And of course, there's other operating costs um, on making sure that everything runs correctly and, you know, setting up with, you know, high availability costs and all that kind of stuff needs to be justified. Um, but the benefit of this kind of um, deployment is that you get com completely control of access. So you control where everything's deployed, you control how many how many brokers in your clusters, you can control how your data is going to be secured, you can control the policy that is applied on top of your um on top of your how your system are architected and everything. And because you know where everything is deployed, then you can kind of um put all everything right next to the workload. So everything is closer. So you, you can, so the network latencies is a lot less um, compared to the others. And last but not least, a lot of the company already have um, committed spend with the, a lot of cloud providers. So they can take advantage of um, of that, of you know, using the promises resource that they were, they were going to use on top of the cloud. So these are the things that um, people kind of, like and don't like about the traditional self-hosted version but then because of the rapid you know software development people wants to have a quicker way of getting things up they don't want to spend you know six months or you know six months of planning and getting people hired getting people um trained on all everything so what they do is they would ask vendors to create a version or to to set up that platform for them so this one is purely hosted by the vendors the vendor is going to set up the services they'll provide a couple of endpoints they'll keep give, give people like where they were installed and then the services will be up and running so the benefit of that was um in, in increase of flexibility so you don't have to commit a lot of resource in advance you can slowly add um, the resource as needed you don't have to have a dedicated sre to understand what the cluster is you have access to all the experts since the vendor hosting that services or the data streaming services in this case has, has been running this for a long time. So you get access to the expert right away. Um, the problem with these kind of um, deployment is the lack of transparency and lack of control, right? Because you don't control where everything is deployed. You don't control, um, you, don't, you don't see how they were implemented. 
you don't know how what's going on underneath the hood because all you see is a very is a class where you don't see how everything was kind of installed and how the policy was applied in terms of security. You don't know where everything was hosted. Sometimes they don't give give you that. So that also introduced some kind of network latency because you don't you don't know what it's you don't know if it's as closer to your workload or if it's kind of like an ocean away from your workload. So that's kind of um, the things that people don't. Uh, people complain about when they're doing a uh, vendor vanished um, services, right? Those kind of services on service, software as a service type of thing, right? And then there could be a net network loophole. If you're not uh, connecting everything correctly, um, you might open up a, uh, you might open up unexpected connections, then that will introduce problems, right? So that is why we said, um, BYOC has been uh, really taken over. In our case, a lot of our customers really like this idea of bring your own cloud. They uh, so there's a so we always know there's a middle ground between you know the self-hosted and the vendor hosted version because this one is that we will as a as a as a um, expert in running the the stream data streaming platform class. Uh, uh, platform, we kind of just deployed everything into the client's cloud. So what, what clients see is that they have com completely access control over things because it's deployed in their cl cloud environments. The cluster is running in their cloud environment. So the data stays within the cloud of the vendors that they could get they get to apply uh, different policies in terms of accessing the platforms. And because the vendors um, can deploy the uh, so we get we can deploy our uh, our platform um, closer to the workload so you can decide where you want everything to deploy so you can introduce a lot less network latencies and I think one of the most um, uh, people find intriguing especially with the C level conversation is that you can use the committed spend because you don't have to so you, you can have your own discount in terms of talking to the cloud providers instead of going through another layers um, by the vendors so uh, but then you also get the benefit of all the experts that you have from um, from the platform so like from from the vendors or from us right so we give you the experts expertise of, hey, this is how you should install a rep in a cluster. This is how you should patch it. And this is how the infrastructure is going to look like. So you've got all of that um, in terms of, uh, you know, having that running in the client environment. So that's really a very good, I, I think um, a lot of our customers were looking into this because they want to have the freedom of controlling your own data. They want to have it all in the, their in their environment, but they also don't. They also want to have access from the expert. They don't want to invest too much in the beginning of hiring a lot of expert running this this um, platform. So, before we dive deep into the architecture, here's a quick overview of what we what we talk about as a data streaming. Uh, platform. So for the for those of you who is already really know who is really into the data streaming world, you probably know about Kafka, right? So Red Panda is another C implemented version of Kafka. So basically what you can what the client can uh, so basically we are a replacement of Kafka. Um, the the client side doesn't have to know anything but um, Red Panda can replace Kafka right away because we are Kafka API. Um, compatible, so the client can directly talk to a Red Panda cluster. But the difference is that we choose to implement in C++, and for everybody that you know, C++ can um, have a lot better accessibilities of you know managing and controlling the lower layer of your computer CPUs and memory. So therefore, we bypass a lot of like JVM um, garbage collections where it's going to take time to dump the heap out, as well as controlling the um, the thread. So, you know, like the context switching in the CPU can take a lot of time in nowadays where we're going to avoid all of that by controlling thread, by write, controlling all the thread, by um, constantly writing in sequence and kind of kind of fits really well with the, you know, the Kafka mentalities of everything logs sequentially, right? So you kind of just put everything with the thread into allocated memory and puts things directly into the, um, into the storage uh, which is going to be either uh, through an MEME um, storage where it's a lot faster nowadays. It's never the the, build, the blocking, the, the bottleneck of, you know, writing data into a storage place. So kind of that's how we see it today. And that's why people, like most of our customer 
loved um, using that and using it to replace um, Kafka. And um, so that's kind of just a quick overview of what we do. So we are a data streaming platform that provides um, data streaming services uh, for all the clients. So we, we, we are very cloud friendly, so we can deploy on a lot of cloud environment, either with um, dedicated machines or we can deploy that on the Kubernetes environment. As you can see, um, so be right before we dive into the architecture, let's start with the first pool. What are you currently using to stream your data? Um, you're using Red Panda, are you using MQTT, Apache, Kafka, Confluent, Pulsar, AWS MSKs, or any other things? All right. So for before we dive into the architecture, let's take a look at from the custom from our customers' lens. So the way that we want it to build is to make it as simple as possible for our users. So to make it as easy as it can be for them to have a very um, smooth adoption of the streaming platform in their own environment. So what they need to do first, we'll give them three steps. That's all they need to do. First of all, they need to provision their appropriate access credentials. So we'll have to, they'll have to give us, um, they'll have to create a, not give us, but have a um, credential that um, allows creation of EKS, creations of setting up networks, um, setting up storages and all that, you know, there's a there's a more detailed um, configurations that's in our documentations. But basically, this is all the infrastructure, right, that we need to have in order to, to set up that infrastructure. But all this are not shared with Red Panda. We don't keep that. So this one is uh, for the user to create, um, but they also keep that in all their own environments. Once they have everything set up, all they need to do is go into Red Panda Cloud and sign up for a account. Right, so we know that you you are you are a customer with us, and then what the customer needs to do is to think about a couple of things. Right, the throughput, the throughput is the um is kind of how we size our clusters. Uh, we tend to be very efficient on using the resource, so we don't need a lot compared to a traditional Kafka deployment. Um, but if you think about it, we want to know how much you're expecting, how much throughput. The bigger the throughput, the more broker you need, and more, the more internal traffic that's going to have within if, if you think about um, data streaming, right? And the second thing is you need to give us your pro call providers. Of course, we need to know that as well because that also determines on the infrastructures of what command that we need to give um, in order to install your infrastructure. And then the, the third one that we will ask you, uh, the customer, is what is your connection type? Is it publicly available or is it internally used only? So this we use this to configure the networkings. So do we need to install an internet gateway or net gateway, you know, for internal access, or do we want to isolate it within a um, a virtual private connection? So everything needs to be connected, um, configured in order to connect internally. Another thing is where your workload is going to be. So this is going to contribute to your network latency. So you want it to be closer to your workload, as closer to your workload as possible. So therefore, we're going to ask you about regions and also availability zones. This will contribute to the high, av high availability strategies that you want to determine, right? So if you have more availability zones, that your uh, fault tolerance will be higher. But again, because it's across AZ, so there's going to be um, a certain cost or a certain type of cost of transferring data in between uh, availability zones, so it's going to be a little bit slower. Um, but it's but then it's more fault tolerant. So depending on what you need, uh, we can all cope with that. But in default, what we do is we will even within the same availability availability zones, we can um, use different placement groups to ensure that all the nodes are in different places, so they don't. Also, well, when things goes wrong, we'll still still have that availability for you as well. So that's something that we do underneath the hood that we don't share with the customers, but it's all um, think about. So once the um, the customer decide on all this, all they need to do is to kick off the deployment, and that's it. They will have a cluster running in their cloud. That's how simple it is, and that's why our customer love it, and that's why we think um, BYOC is the future. But in order to get everything running, it's um, you have, have to have a lot of nuts and bolts built underneath the hood in order to make it run as smooth as, as simple from the customer's point of view. And I'm just going to take you over some of the things that we did during the installation. So first of all, 
the customer will need to obtain a Red Panda ID from us uh, from our cloud environment. So basically, what they need to do is they just need to register, and we'll give them an ID. And they'll have to log into either the AWS account or Google Cloud account. Currently, we we provide two cloud um, as as two two cloud for hosting their clusters, Google and um, AWS. So they need to log into that with their credential in their environment. So this is not shared with Red Panda. And then what Red what um, what they need to do is to also download a tooling called Red Panda Keeper, which is a tool that uses to administer, install, you can do whatever with Red Panda. This is a great, this is the, the tool set. So basically what they need to do is just um, download the tool and run a command line using um, the BYOC um, functions underneath Red Panda Keeper. And this Red Panda Keeper is going to then kick off the deployment from customers, um, from customers uh, environment. And then it is going to talk directly into uh, into the cloud environment of what they have, and then install something called an agent. And this agent um, is also powered by Terraform. It's going to then set up all the infrastructure need um, to run the clusters. So it is going to first set up the networkings. Um, so make sure that it's in the right subnets, the right VPCs. You know, I'm talking AWS terms because I'm more familiar with AWS. But, and then you also have, um, then we also have to think about the storages. So we'll spin up the storage for that. And then because we want to make sure everything's flexible, it's easy to add another node and all that for the, for the future purpose, we'll install everything on top of a Kubernetes. So, and after that, we'll then install the Red Panda um, cluster on, in, in the Kubernetes cluster along with another um, pretty useful tool, which is Red Panda Console, that is going to um, let users see what's going on inside their cluster. And this is an other small um, artifacts and utilities on, in, in the cluster as well, but mainly the cluster and the console. And that's kind of what happens when the users kick off the um, environment. And after that, they get to see their entire cluster running in their environment. And when, so this is kind of what happens if um, the customer wants to access and take a look at what's going on inside the cluster. So basically what they need to do is log into the Cloud UI, which is hosted by Red Panda. And what happens is Red Panda is going to show you where everything is. And then it's going inside the Red Panda um, UI, we, we um, added a, um, we, we did something really clever. So we merge whatever is inside Red Panda console and we kind of just, um, then we stream that information directly from Red Panda console into um, the customer site, into the customer's computer. So it's coming from the browser. In, what is it? It's going into directly into customer's browser instead of going through Red Panda. So we don't see anything because inside the console will show you how many topics you have, how many petitions you have, and then inside each topics will show all the um, all the all the messages or the events that streaming all the data that was streaming into the topics. So we don't want to know that um, for Red Panda. So everything is going directly into the browser of yours through the cloud. You um, using the cloud UI login as the single sign on endpoints, and then it's going to um, show you what's going on inside the cluster. And if we want to operate, say if something goes wrong or if there needs to be an upgrade. So, so something that's really cool about BYOC is that um, we let the user decide when they want to upgrade their clusters. So it's not up to us, it's up to the users because everybody operates into in the same in, in different pace, right? Some of them were in a slower pace, some of them were faster. So we want to make sure that they, they can upgrade on their own needs. So that's kind of why we did that. And so whenever there's whenever the user decided to upgrade their clusters. What, they, what happens is that the cloud environment, our cloud control plane, so we kind of divided everything into two different things. The control plane was, is kind of like a control center where it's hosted by Red Panda. We decide on the things that can be upgraded, which versions you want to upgrade it to. And the data plane is where the, the actual streaming platform is operating, which is serving its need of streaming data into for different clients and stuff like that. So those are the two different um, planes that we have. And um, so what happens if what if you want to patch it? So basically the, the control plane is going to issue a command and 
that is going to say, hey, um, patch um, to the next version of the cluster. So, and then it's going to break it down into uh, smaller tasks. Instead of like doing a big patch, it's going to break it down to small tasks. And we'll track all the path, all the all the all the tasks, and then the agent itself is gonna pull. So instead of us sending information into, um, into the agent, the agent actually pulls, so it can do a reverse, um, in the reverse directions of pulling the tasks, constantly pulling the task from the U, uh, from the control plane into the data data plane. So once the data plane sees the command, it's going to. Um, run the command, apply the changes, and then you see everything upgraded um, one at a time. So that's kind of how it works. And then um, the so that's that's how the command line flows. But we also collect some of the data, um, the publicly open metrics coming from. We don't see the actual data in the thing, but we kind of collect all the red panda metrics showing um, partitions and leaders and see if things going goes wrong. But that goes that gets sent back to cloud UI. So we monitor the health of your cluster, making sure everything goes goes okay. So the benefit of going through well the benefit of this design, why we go through all this pain of designing it like this, is because first of all, by deploying it, um, by deploying into customers' cloud, you get to decide wherever you want to do. You have more visibilities. You can it's closer to your workload. And if something is wrong with the control plane, if something goes wrong in Red Panda, what happens is it's it's not going to affect the actual data plane of serving the services, because the agent is doing a pooling. So if it couldn't pull anything, that probably means that I don't have anything else to do. So the the control plane kind of just keep doing what it's supposed to do. And if the customer, and then if it comes back up, it's going to come back up and start working again, right? And if the customer ever don't want to work with Red Panda anymore, they can simply cut off the connections um, between the two and then still operate on their own. So, I mean, so it's the, the, the isolations of two planes and making sure that the, the, the two planes operate independently kind of helps when designing this, this is kind of a big concept for us when designing the, uh, the BYOC um, services. And here is a quick view of um, how our cluster components was deployed. So we have all that all our um, all our brokers and our our all our brokers deployed in Kubernetes, right? So because the hardest part of running a streaming data platform, like all the other databases and all the data related product is the data. We don't wanna lose any of them to keep them safe, to keep them reliable. We wanna make sure every, so the, the hardest thing is to keep the state. You could not simply spin up an informal pod and hoping that if something goes wrong, it's gonna recover. It is gonna be hard and it's, it's gonna take time for it to recover if, um, if it's informal. So, we, what we did is we did that with stable set, making sure that if something goes wrong with the pod itself, your um, persistent volumes and everything that's stored underneath the hood can still operate. So, and we have an operator that kind of looks after all the services running on top of the Kubernetes and up changing things um, independently. The console is also deployed into Kubernetes and there's a bunch of um, smaller software uh, utilities that we kind of run in, on top of that as well. And we also connected um, we also offload some of the historical data back to the S3 to take, take advantage of that cheaper cloud storage. So everything gets offloaded to that as kind of how we deploy our cluster on top of the cloud. So if you think about our control plane, our control plane is um, in order to actually serve that, you know, that really independent data plane, there's a lot of things that you need to take consider about. Well, the first thing is um, different versions because different customers spin up their environment different times. And because we also allowed, um, you know, letting user to update, upgrade their services on their own, like deciding on what the timing of that. So it is, it is crucial for us to kind of provide them and to understand like where they are, kind of uh, versions they have. And because there's just way too many components in the infrastructure side as well, like moving parts. So we have to make sure that everything that we re release is a, um, a certified one. 
So what happens inside our um, control plane is whenever we did a, uh, when we did, were developing new features and all that kind of stuff, it goes to a proper CI phase and all that is very simple. That's very, um, everybody does that. And then when we get to the release um, pipelines, we have a, um, a we have verifications and scans for everything, such as the code qualities, container scans, library dependencies, um, scans, and all that, making sure that it's all running. So it's a certified release. And with this certified release, we'll create a software um, bill of materials. And each certified bill of materials um, kind of represents a, a snapshot of how, how this one is verified. And we'll use that for, for the user release. So we know where they are. So when the user comes in and when they were asking for a new versions of um, Red Panda running on, on the cloud itself. Um, so basically what happens is it's going to pull um, from the certified cloud release and looking at what's the most current release what we have and then pull the SBOM into the software bill of materials into, into our control plane. API and this one is going to take a look at it and then store the username with the SBOM so we know um, how they were deployed. And then what happens that is we have a, then we replicate this um, using CDC. So everything is just kind of stored into a database. Then we use a, um, a change data capture mechanism to um, export all the events, all the things that's happening to a Red Panda cluster into, underneath the hood. Um, the reason we do we're doing that is because there's a lot more internet in um, internal operations, and so we want to have multiple receivers or, or consumers of these events and kind of react upon their own. But the most important one was the um, was the one that goes into the workflow because the workflow is the actual um, control of how we kind of wanted to install and how we want to. Um, how we want to deploy or patching or change anything um, in the data plane as well. So this one kind of controls everything. So once this uh, once this uh, new S bomb gets sent into the workflow, the workflow is going to kick up a the workflow engine. The workflow engine is going to kick off a new workflow, and that is going to break the entire workflow into different tasks or activities, and then that gets breaked into our, uh, and then that gets picked up by our agents and then agents gonna apply that into the data plane. So that is what's happening in the control plane. And um, that's kind of um, what's going on in how do we deliver a more secure and uh, controlled software supply in, in terms of that. And if you think about the workflow, right? So when when the things goes into the workflow, the workflow engine is actually a uh, it's we use Temporal for our workflow engine, but we also build a couple of different um, like interface in like a, a proxy interface in front of um, the workflow server in case that we in case that any version change or any API change or anything we use gRPC um, as our endpoints um, as it's easier to convert that into REST and all that. Um, so our we have an agent proxy that is going to be used to talk to our, um, our different customers. And whenever there's a new installations or new patching or anything, uh, a new customer coming, they, they will kick off a new workflow. And each workflow will then deploy, will then be, um, so they're, they will they'll create each workflow and each workflow, because the reason why we're using workflow is that if you think about how we deploy um, things into, into our cloud, everything is long running and there can be problems, right? So if you're spinning up a, say, a EKS, right? Sometimes it fails or sometimes it just, it takes a very long time for it to feedback. So that's why we did, this workflow is a stateful workflow. We keep the long running, we break down things and we can, if we will run things in parallel if we can, but there are just some things that were are dependent on each other. So that's why we need to create a work, a, a code workflow kind of just take over things and um, and we kind of and also taking account of the complex environment as well. So that's what what, what we did there. Um, and then in the workflow, we kind of break things down by nature. It breaks down into different workers and different tasks and activities. And then it gets put into different queues. And then um, so we'll well be able to track where this customer is at each each customer where they'll get their own queue and that's going to connect to their agent 
and all the cues will then show, okay, so why we have this, um, we're, this person is at creating the VPC stage and this person got to the S3, this person's got you know, their stuff done and well, the other ones we patching. So we kind of see um, how everything works together and that's how the workflow um, was done in our environment. Uh, so for zero trust access, so this is for this is in the situations if we want to break the glass, right? Like there's a lot of times when we need it to access if something goes wrong. Unfortunately, hopefully nothing goes wrong. But if there's you know, some things goes wrong, we want to make sure that we follow the zero trust access um, mechanic mechanism where everything needs to be authorized and authenticated externally, internally, whatever needs to be authorized or authenticated through dyna dynamically. So it's not, it's not static and it, it can only be valid for a certain amount of time. So what happens if the Red Panda engineers wants to see what's going on inside the cluster? What, the, what happens if they'll have to sign on? The proxy services is going to go ahead and then authenticate against this person and ask for permissions from the customers and the customer, once they permission it, they'll receive a token to access the content. And then the prep of engineers will then use that issue token to access the environment. And everything is, um, it's, it's, and because this is a reverse proxy, so um, there's no going in, it's just going out. So as well as um, authentication services, uh, auditing services where everything they do um, every single command they put in will be tracked and recorded. So um, we want to make sure everything is 100% secure. We're not doing crazy things uh, for the customer, but just helping them to solve problems. And that's kind of what we did there. Um, the other, the last, the last thing that we did for observability point of view is the observabilities. Um, for is, is observability. Um, so the things that we did for is kind of picking up two things: log and metrics. So we use the uh, Prometheus to scrape all the things that we did, uh, mostly seeing the uh, balance, if all the, all the brokers are balanced, um, if the leaders are balanced across different places, if there's um, no leader partitions, how were the partitions were doing, how many were assigned in particular brokers. Um, so these are the things that we look for. And the throughput, the throughput rate at um, P99 latencies P95 latencies. These are the things I would look for um, in terms of looking at the metrics and see if something goes wrong, we'll, we'll know. And um, the other thing is we'll use um, full bit to um, collect data and that gets stream that gets collected um, from Grafana low keys and then um, sent to us in the, uh, and show in the Grafana dashboard. So we have access to kind of the log in um, the broker itself, but not everything else. So that's kind of what happens in the data plane. Um, everything was all geared towards sort of providing a better services for BYOC secure mainly and automated. And um, that's kind of what's going on inside the, um, the control planes. And this is what happens in the data plane. So data plane is pretty simple and forward, not nice and simple, like similar to what you are doing in a self-hosted version. So Red Panda will be deployed under the, under in a VPC, right? In a virtual private connection, like it's it's gonna be isolated in that. And so in order for you, for the other services to access um, the Red Panda cluster, um, you can either access it um, if you have already um, configured that as public accessible endpoints, then you can access it through the internet gateways and the, um, the, the clients will be able to access it through um, with, the security, uh, some of the security endpoints with ACL, making sure they create the, the credentials um, for the users. Um, everything will be encrypted um, through TLS, so everything is secured. Um, in terms of um, services that's internal, running internally with the same cloud um, in a different VPC, what you can do is um, you can use uh, VPC peering. I know private link is coming up uh, real soon, uh, so that's uh, there's a different all these different ways of connecting to. Um, the VPC inside the Red Panda cluster. Other things that you can do, uh, oops, other, other um, way that I see people do it is uh, using through microservices as it's, um, so they'll open up their microservices um, and then the microservice is gonna do some kind of pre 
uh, pre-processing of the data and then that streams into Repanda clusters and then Repanda clusters just throw all the information back into the cloud storages or pass it back to other services as well, data storage or data lake, whatever um, they were using. So that's kind of the things I saw um, or for the customer use case. Um, some of the different ways of how we deploy um, our cluster is when you choose the public accessible cluster, you will be, um, the RepPanda will be installed in the public subnet. And, um, and the RepPanda will be installed at the same subnet as your agent. Um, so we don't have a lot of like unexpected uh, network calls and all that. And RepPanda, the, the traffic goes in between will be um, in between the, in between the brokers that's um, internal RepPanda replication um, traffic as well as externally that will be accessing through um, the endpoints, the clients and the VPC connections that was uh, appearing connections that you appeared towards different applications outside. So that's kind of what we did. All the, all the listeners are protected through authentications and authorizations. Um, with the private cluster, this one is a little bit uh, more complicated, but I think it's 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 for the sake of um, making sure that everything was secured. So your dependent cluster will, along with all the connectors, and the console itself will be um, will be um, stored, will be deployed in a, a private subnet. So it will be it will be isolated from your your agent, and. The agent, the agent will be in a public subnet because it still needs to talk to the external um, control plane. So that's why we still need, we still need this public subnet in order for it to connect. Um, but uh, just, but we want to isolate your cluster. So that's why we have it private and then public. And that's kind of the main difference between the two. So kind of depending on what the customer wants and what would they prefer. And this is kind of um, how we did things. Just to do a quick wrap, uh, recap on the traffic that's going to happen inside the entire cluster. So we've got north and south um, traffic. So that's where the Kafka API, so that's actually the streaming, was, that's the actual streaming goes back and forth between the cluster and the client. So that goes back and forth, that's the north side traffic. And you, go, you, still, you have the bootstrap traffic where it's the first initial call from the client to ask for where all the brokers are. You've got schema registry asking for all the data format of, of all the topics that you offer, like kind of what, they, what, what the data shape is like. Um, HTTP proxy, if you don't wanna use Kafka protocol, there you go. You've got a HTTP um, protocol uh, to put your events in or to retrieve events. And then we've also got, you know, Red Panda class, uh, console where it's a GUI interface where you can show everything. Also um, the Prometheus matrix that goes out um, to um, to our uh, to to Repanda as well. So that's like the north south traffic internally in between inside the um, uh, the east to west traffic. That will be mostly mostly the uh, replication Repanda RPC. You know how different petitions need to be replicated across different brokers. So they they need to replicate things. Um, so that's where most of the Repanda. Uh, that that will be mostly the where the east and west traffic will be. Of course, then you've got some admin APIs where if you're gonna do admin stuff, it's gonna be go going through that traffic as well. Um, south and north control plane, you need to um, where this is where the the agent is gonna pull things from and then break the glass is some, sometimes if we wanna go into the cluster and look at things for you, this is where the south and north traffic's. And the other thing is download the software after artifacts. That's the time when we want to up upgrade and patch. This is, um, and this is where it's getting all the information from our SBOM and download all the right artifacts down into your cluster, right? Remember, that's kind of the south to north traffic. Just a quick summary of where everything's are. All right, let's um, go through the next poll. What are your biggest issues with running a streaming data platform? Is it the system com complexity? administrative overhead, performance concerns, security and compliance concerns, or you don't have just this running a data, stream data platform is super, super easy. I don't have any problem with that. All right, perfect. Um, so I don't think I have a time to show the entire full demo, but I do want to really quickly show you what's going on uh, inside the cluster. So I have a, 
I have a cluster that I spin up. This is an entirely BYOC cluster. So when you spin up a BYOC cluster, this is kind of what you see. You see the Kafka API. So this is a bootstrap URL that you see where the user is connecting to, schema registry and all that, um, things that you see from the north-south traffic, right? Um, so this, cl this cluster is actually running in my cloud. Right. So if you go to, I'm, I'm running everything in my AWS. So as I am the owner of this cluster, I get to see what's going on inside the clusters. I get to decide on, you know, if I still want to run this or not, all that kind of stuff. So this, I own this cloud. I see everything. Oops. I see everything that I need to run this cloud. Right. So, and I can also see the different um, VPCs that it created. Right. So, you know, um, VPCs and all that kind of stuff it created for me. I can see the S3 bucket, you know, the things that it's, it's going to dump all the historical data into it. It kind of just, I can see everything going, what's going on because I am the owner of the cloud and they were just operating in my cloud. And I get to see the EC2 instance, which is also running the, the agent as well, right? The agent is running here. So I've got some agents running. Um, sorry, I have a bunch of stuff in my here, that, the old stuff, but you get the ideas. You should just have one, by the way. One agent is running inside and kind of that's um, really simple and easy. And then what you can see here is I'm gonna start writing, sending data in there, right? So what happens here is I go, if I have, I have my own, I have my own Python application that is running inside this cluster, right? So it's it's in this cluster, it's in, 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 a, in a separate VPC. So what happens is I have a VPC peering created, peering connection. So I can start writing information from my, I can start putting information in my cloud. I'm gonna start, I'm gonna start that application by turning it on. And then it's going to, and start pumping information into the the into my into my cloud environment. And if you look at the topics here, you will see I'm it's starting to stream data into here. And this is the console that I'm talking about. So I'm logging to cloud. I'm logging into um, Red Panda Cloud. But what's the the funny thing is that this and all this information was directly coming from my cloud instead of going through Red Panda and coming back. So we did something really smart here where we kind of just inject that, the console into, into the browser here. So I can see what's going on, what's coming into, into my cloud environment. It's, it's coming here. I can see the data's coming in. So I'm gonna, I'm going to start another. So this is what happens. I have a Red Panda WIOC clusters running. I have a, um, a cluster that's here that is going, that is sending data into that through VPC peering. And I am going to um, run the Quarkus app where this app is going to start um, reading information from my cloud. And you, what you can see here is now it's picking up data. Um, from here, you get to see uh, big things. I have consumer groups where my consumer groups are now consuming things um, from my uh, so you've got Quarkus receiver, and I think this one, probably this one, I'm not sure. This one is um is my client. So, all right. So I think I that's I think that's all the time I have. Um, let me quickly switch back. Just do a quick wrap. Um, the reason why we did you know bring your own cloud is that it's private, so your data never leaves the cloud, and the customer loved it. Um, I don't know if you heard about this data sovereignty issues that people were having. You've had a, a lot of regulations that re regulates people from where their data is, needs to be located. So, and then that privacy preserve, preserve interactive experiences, right? So, and then what people like about the what people like about is that it is hassle free, right? The user only see three steps, and they have a running data platform, and and. Uh, last but not least, I think it appears to a lot of the CTOs that it's that the C level users is that they, this is going to cost a lot less compared to Kafka because we're just a lot more efficient and you get to use the, you get to maximize your committed spend with the cloud providers. Um, that is, that's, I, that's it. Um, you know what? 
I think that's open up for the Q and A's. Do we have any Q and A's? Hi, Christina. Yeah, we have um, a few questions. Uh, the first one is, is BYOC more or less expensive than dedicated? Um, it, it depends. Um, so for the dedicated, you get to kind of um, work with the vendors and see how they were charging you. But for the BYOC, I would assume it will be a lot less because, um, well, not a lot less, it's going to be less because you control the budget, you kind of control the, the hosting size and how you're going to negotiate with your cloud providers. So the better negotiation you can do with the cloud providers, the less you spend. So I would assume it's, it's all really up to you and kind of how you negotiate the price and plan, plan your budget around things. Awesome. And then uh, here's another question. Are there any use cases where BYOC isn't a good idea? Isn't a good idea. Um, well, I mean, BYOC is it's just another way of managing your 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 cloud your streaming platform. So I don't think there's a bad case around it really because it's from a customer perspective so i'm a client i use i used to write a lot of applications that talks to a kafka or red panda cluster for me it doesn't really matter i can just whether it's operated whatever i can just use it i guess from an administrative perspective if you already have a bigger team you have hundreds of clusters running in your environment maybe that's the best case where you want to do it on your own otherwise i think byoc is a very nice um intro gateway to intro and medium um intermediate users where they don't want to have a lot of user a lot of um training people they don't they, they don't spend a lot of time operating that so it's just different types of things right so yeah awesome thank you so much um and if there are no other questions um we can just go ahead and wrap up um so thank you so much, Christina, for your time today. And thank you everyone for joining us. As a reminder, this recording will be on the Linux Foundation's YouTube page later today. We hope you join us for web future webinars. Have a wonderful day.